Next on 4 Extra, celebrating the 70th anniversary of Ian Fleming's very first 007 adventure, it's Bond, James Bond, on 4 Extra, in the first of two omnibus editions of Casino Royale. Published in 1953, the first film version of this story, of Bond's encounter with the sinister fraudster Le Chiffre, was made in 1967 and starred David Niven. The later, grittier 2006 remake with Daniel Craig is much closer to this, the original story. Alex Jennings reads part one of Casino Royale. The scent and smoke and sweat of a casino are nauseating at three in the morning. James Bond suddenly knew that he was tired. He always acted on this knowledge. It helped him to avoid staleness and the sensual bluntness that breeds mistakes. He shifted himself unobtrusively away from the roulette he had been playing and went to stand for a moment at the brass rail which surrounded the top table in the salle privée. Le Chiffre was still playing and still apparently winning. In the shadow of his thick left arm there nestled a discreet stack of big yellow plaques worth half a million francs each. Bond watched the curious, impressive profile for a time, and then he shrugged his shoulders to lighten his thoughts and moved away. He imagined tomorrow's regular morning meeting of the casino committee. Uh, Monsieur Le Chiffre made two million. He played his usual game. Miss Fairchild made a million in an hour and then left. She played with coolness. Uh, Monsieur Le Vicomte de Villerin made one million too at roulette. He was lucky. Uh, then the Englishman, Mr. Bond, increased his winnings to exactly three million over the two days. It seems that he is persevering and he has luck. Merci, Monsieur Xavier. Merci, Monsieur le Président or something like that, thought Bond, as he pushed his way through the swing doors of the salle privée and nodded to the bored man in evening clothes, whose job it is to bar your entry and your exit with the electric footswitch which can lock the doors at any hint of trouble. He breathed the sweet night air deeply and focused his senses and his wits. He wanted to know if anyone had searched his room since he had left it before dinner. He walked across the broad boulevard and through the gardens to the Hotel Splendide. He smiled at the concierge who gave him his key, number 45 on the first floor, and took the cable from her. It was from Jamaica, and read, Bond, Splendide, Royal Les Eaux, Inferior Havana Cigar Production, All Cuban Factories. Ten million, repeat, ten million. Stop. Hope this figure you require. Regards, Da Silva. This meant that ten million francs was on the way to him. It was the reply to a request Bond had sent that afternoon through Paris to his headquarters in London, asking for more funds. Clements, the head of Bond's department, had spoken to M, who had smiled wryly and told the broker to fix it with the treasury. Bond took his key and said good night and turned to the stairs, shaking his head at the liftman. Bond knew what an obliging danger signal a lift could be. He didn't expect anyone to be moving on the first floor, but he preferred to be prudent. Walking quietly up on the balls of his feet, he turned off the stairs into the corridor and walked softly to the door of his room. Bond knew exactly where the switch was, and it was with one flow of motion that he stood on the threshold with the door full open, the light on, and a gun in his hand. The safe empty room, sneered at him. Locking himself in, he bent down and inspected one of his own black hairs, which still lay undisturbed where he had left it before dinner, wedged into the drawer of the writing desk. Next, he examined a faint trace of talcum powder on the inner rim of the porcelain handle of the clothes cupboard. It appeared immaculate. He went into the bathroom, lifted the cover of the lavatory system, and verified the level of the water against a small scratch on the copper ballcock. Doing all this, inspecting these minute burglar alarms, did not make him feel foolish or self-conscious. He was a secret agent, and still alive thanks to his exact attention to the detail of his profession. 
Satisfied that his room had not been searched while he was at the casino, Bond undressed and took a cold shower. Then he lit his seventieth cigarette of the day and sat down at the writing table with the thick wad of his stake money and winnings beside him and entered some figures in a small notebook. Over the two days' play, he was up exactly three million francs. For a few moments, Bond sat motionless, gazing out of the window across the dark sea. Then he shoved the bundle of banknotes under the pillow of the ornate single bed, cleaned his teeth, turned out the lights, and climbed with relief between the harsh French sheets. His last action was to slip his right hand under the pillow until it rested under the butt of the thirty-eight Colt police positive with the sawn barrel. Then he slept, and with the warmth and humour of his eyes extinguished, his features relapsed into a taciturn mask, ironical, brutal, and cold. Two weeks before, this memorandum had gone from Station S of the Secret Service to M, who was then, and is today, head of this adjunct to the British Defence Ministries. To M, from Head of S. Subject, a project for the destruction of Monsieur Le Chiffre, alias The Number, Herr Numa, Herr Ziffer, etc., one of the opposition's chief agents in France and undercover paymaster of the Syndicat des Ouvriers d'Alsace, the communist-controlled trade union in the heavy and transport industries of Alsace, and, as we know, an important fifth column in the event of war with Redland. We have been feeling for some time that Le Chiffre is getting into deep water. It seems that he is on the brink of a financial crisis. Certain straws in the wind were noticed by Agent 1860, some discreet sales of jewellery, the disposal of a villa at Antibes, and a general tendency to check the loose spending, which has always been a feature of his way of life. Further inquiries were made with the help of our friends of the Douzième Bureau, with whom we have been working jointly on this case, and a curious story has come to light. In January 1946, Le Chiffre bought control of a chain of brothels, known as the Cordon Jaune, operating in Normandy and Brittany. He was foolish enough to employ for this purpose some 50 million francs of the monies entrusted to him by Leningrad Section 3 for the financing of SODA, the trade union mentioned above. Barely three months later, on the 13th of April, there was passed in France Law No. 46685, known popularly as La Loi Matre Richard, closing all houses of ill fame and forbidding the sale of pornographic books and films. This knocked the bottom out of his investment almost overnight. Suddenly Le Chiffre was faced with a serious deficit in his union funds. Today, nothing remains of Le Chiffre's original investment and any routine inquiry would reveal a deficit of around 50 million francs in the trade union funds of which he is the treasurer and paymaster. It does not seem that the suspicions of Leningrad have been aroused yet, but, unfortunately for Le Chiffre, it is possible that at any rate Smirsch is on the scent. Last week, a high-grade source of Station P reported that a senior official of this efficient organ of Soviet vengeance had left Warsaw for Strasbourg via the eastern sector of Berlin. If Le Chiffre knew that Smirsch was on his tail or that they had the smallest suspicion of him, he would have no alternative but to commit suicide or attempt to escape. But his present plan suggests that while he is certainly desperate, he does not yet realise that his life may be at stake. It is these rather spectacular plans of his that have suggested to us a counter-operation which, though risky and unconventional, we submit at the end of this memorandum with confidence. In brief, Le Chief plans, we believe, to follow the example of most other desperate till robbers and make good the deficit in his accounts by gambling. We know that he has taken a small villa in the neighbourhood of Royal Les Eaux, just north of Dieppe, for a week from a fortnight tomorrow. It is here that Le Chief will, we are confident, endeavour on or after the 15th of June to make a profit at Baccarat of 50 million francs on a working capital of 25 million and, incidentally, save his life. A proposed counter-operation. 
It will be greatly in the interests of this country and of the other nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that this powerful Soviet agent should be ridiculed and destroyed, that his communist trade union should be bankrupted and brought into disrepute, and that this potential fifth column, with a strength of 50,000, capable in time of war of controlling a wide sector of France's northern frontier, should lose faith and cohesion. All this would result if Le Chiffre could be defeated at the tables. The NB, assassination is pointless. Leningrad would quickly cover up his defalcations and make him into a martyr. We therefore recommend that the finest gambler available to the service should be given the necessary funds and endeavour to out-gamble this man. Signed, S. Head of S, the section of the Secret Service concerned with the Soviet Union, was so keen on his plan for the destruction of Le Chiffre that he took the memorandum himself and went up to the top floor of the gloomy building overlooking Regent's Park. He walked belligerently up to M's chief of staff. Now look here, Bill, I want to sell something to the chief. Is this a good moment? What do you think, Penny? The chief of staff turned to M's private secretary, who shared the room with him. Miss Moneypenny would have been desirable, but for eyes which were cool and direct and quizzical. Should be all right. He won a bit of a victory, the F.O. this morning, and he's not got anyone for the next half an hour. She smiled encouragingly at head of S. The chief of staff crossed his office, docket in hand, and went through the double doors leading into M's room. In a moment, he came out, and over the entrance a small blue light burned the warning that M was not to be disturbed. James Bond's interview with M had been short. What about it, Bond? Bond looked across the desk into the shrewd, clear eyes. It's very kind of you, sir. I'd like to do it. But I can't promise to win. The odds at Bachera are the best after trente et quarante, but I might get a bad run against me and get cleaned out. Play's going to be pretty high. Opening will go up to half a million, I should think. Bond was stopped by the cold eyes. M knew all this already. That was his job. Knowing the odds at everything. And knowing men, his own and the opposition's. Bond wished he had kept quiet about his misgivings. He can have a bad run too, said M. You'll have plenty of capital. Up to twenty-five million. The same as him. He smiled. Go over a few days before the big game starts and get your hand in. I'm going to ask the deuxième to stand by. I'll try to persuade them to send Matisse. You seem to get on well with him in Monte Carlo on that other casino job. And I'm going to tell Washington. Anything else? Bond shook his head. I'd certainly like to have Matisse, sir. Well, we'll see. Try and bring it off. We're going to look pretty foolish if you don't. And watch out. This sounds an amusing job, but I don't think it's going to be. Well, best of luck. Thank you, sir, said Bond, and went to the door. Just a minute. Bond turned. I think I'll keep you covered, Bond. Two heads are better than one. They'll get in touch with you at Royale. You needn't worry. It'll be someone good. Bond would have preferred to work alone, but one didn't argue with M. He left the room, hoping that the man they sent would be loyal to him, and neither stupid nor, worse still, ambitious. Two weeks after his interview with M, James Bond awoke in his room at the Hotel Splendide. He had arrived at Royal Les Eaux in time for luncheon two days before. There had been no attempt to contact him, and there had been no flicker of curiosity when he had signed the register, James Bond, Port Maria, Jamaica. M had expressed no interest in his cover. Once you start to make a set at Le Chiffre at the tables, you'll have had it, he said. But wear a cover that will stick with the general public. Bond knew Jamaica well, so he asked to be controlled from there and to pass as a Jamaican plantocrat whose father had made his pile in tobacco and sugar 
and whose son chose to play it away on the stock markets and in casinos. Bond had spent the last two afternoons and most of the nights at the casino playing complicated progression systems on the even chances at roulette. He had made some three million francs and had given his nerves and card sense a thorough workout. He had got the geography of the casino clear in his mind. Above all, he had been able to observe Le Chiffre at the tables and to note ruefully that he was a faultless and lucky gambler. Bond liked to make a good breakfast. After a cold shower, he looked out at the beautiful day and consumed half a pint of iced orange juice, three scrambled eggs and bacon, and a double portion of coffee without sugar. He lit his first cigarette, a Balkan and Turkish mixture made for him by Morlands of Grosvenor Street, and watched the small waves lick the long seashore. He was lost in his thoughts when the telephone rang. It was the concierge announcing that a director of Radio Stangtor was waiting below with the wireless set he had ordered from Paris. Of course, said Bond. Send him up. This was the cover fixed by the deuxième bureau for their liaison man with Bond. Bond watched the door, hoping that it would be Matisse. When Matisse came in, a respectable businessman carrying a large square parcel by its leather handle, Bond smiled broadly and would have greeted him with warmth if Matisse had not frowned and held up his free hand after carefully closing the door. I have just arrived from Paris, monsieur, and here is the set you asked to have on approval. Bond lifted his eyebrows at this mystery-making. Matisse paid no attention. He placed the set, which he had unwrapped, on the floor beside the unlit panel electric fire below the mantelpiece. It is just past eleven, he said, and I see that the compagnon de la chanson should now be on the medium wave from Rome. Let us see what the reception is like. It should be a fair test. Matisse winked. He fiddled at the back of the set. Suddenly an appalling roar of static filled the small room. Oh, my dear monsieur, forgive me, please. Badly tuned. And he again bent to the dials. After a few adjustments, the close harmony of the French came over the air, and Matisse walked up and clapped Bond very hard on the back and wrung his hand until Bond's fingers ached. My dear friend, Matisse was delighted. You are blown, blown, blown. Up there, he pointed at the ceiling. At this moment, either Monsieur Muntz or his alleged wife, allegedly bedridden with the grip, is deafened, absolutely deafened, and I hope in agony. He grinned with pleasure at Bond's frown of disbelief. Then he became serious. How it has happened, I don't know. They must have been on to you for several days before you arrived. The opposition is here in real strength. This is an old-fashioned hotel. There are disused chimneys behind these electric fires, just here. He pointed a few inches above the panel fire. He suspended a very powerful radio pickup. The wires run up the chimney to behind the Munsi's electric fire, where there is an amplifier. Some of this we knew because in France we are very clever. The rest we confirmed by unscrewing your electric fire a few hours before you got here. Suspiciously, Bond walked over and examined the screws which secured the panel to the wall. Their grooves showed minute scratches. No, to business, said Matisse, before our good compagnon ran out of breath. First of all, you will be pleased with your number two. She is very beautiful. Bond frowned. Very beautiful indeed. Satisfied with Bond's reaction, Matisse continued. She has black hair, blue eyes, and uh, splendid um, protuberances. And she is a wireless expert, which, though sexually less interesting, makes her a perfect employee of Radio Stangtor and assistant to myself in my capacity as wireless salesman for this rich summer season down here. Bond was not amused. What the hell do they want to send me a woman for? He said bitterly. Do they think this is a bloody picnic? Calm yourself, my dear James. She's as cold as an icicle. Her cover's perfect, and I have arranged for her to team up with you quite smoothly. What is more natural than that you should pick up a pretty girl here, as a Jamaican millionaire? He coughed respectfully. What with your hot blood and all, you would look naked without one. Bond grunted dubiously. Any other surprises? He asked suspiciously. 
Nothing very much, answered Matisse. Le Chiffre is installed in his villa. It's about ten miles down the coast road. He has his two guards with him. They look pretty capable fellows. Anything else? asked Bond. No. Come to the bar of the Hermitage before lunch. I'll fix the introduction. Ask her to dinner this evening. Then it will be natural for her to come into the casino with you. I'll be there too, but in the background. Oh, and there's an American called Leiter here, staying in the hotel. Felix Leiter. He is the CIA chap from Fontainebleau. London told me to tell you. He looks okay. May come in useful. A torrent of Italian burst from the wireless set on the floor. Mattis switched it off, and they exchanged some phrases about the set and about how Bond should pay for it. Then, with effusive farewells and a final wink, Mattis bowed himself out. Bond sighed. Women were for recreation. On a job, they got in the way and fogged things up with sex and hurt feelings. Bitch, said Bond. Then, remembering the Munzes, he said, Bitch again, more loudly, and walked out of the room. It was twelve o'clock when Bond left the Splendide, and the clock on the Marie was stumbling through its midday carillon. There was something splendid about the Negresco Baroque of the Casino Royale, a strong whiff of Victorian elegance and luxury. Against the background of this luminous and sparkling stage, Bond stood in the sunshine and felt his mission to be incongruous and remote. He shrugged away the momentary feeling of unease and walked round the back of his hotel and down the ramp to the garage. Before his rendezvous at the Hermitage, he decided to take his car down the coast road and have a quick look at Le Chiffre's villa. Bond's car was his only personal hobby. One of the last of the four-and-a-half-litre Bentleys with the supercharger by Amherst Villas, he had bought it almost new in 1933 and had kept it in careful storage through the war. Bond drove it hard and well and with an almost sensual pleasure. He eased the car out of the garage and up the ramp and soon the loitering drumbeat of the two-inch exhaust was echoing down the tree-lined boulevard through the crowded main street of the little town and off through the sand dunes to the south. An hour later, Bond walked into the Hermitage Bar and chose a table near one of the broad windows. He ordered an Americano and examined the sprinkling of overdressed customers, mostly from Paris, he guessed, who sat talking with focus and vivacity, creating that theatrically clubbable atmosphere of l'heure de l'apéritif. Bond's eye was caught by the tall figure of Matisse on the pavement outside. His face turned in animation to a dark-haired girl in grey. Bond waited for them to come through the street door into the bar, but, for appearance's sake, continued to stare out of the window at the passers-by. But surely it is Monsieur Bond! Matisse's voice behind him was full of surprised delight. Bond, appropriately flustered, rose to his feet. May I present my colleague, Mademoiselle Lind? My dear, this is a gentleman from Jamaica with whom I had the pleasure of doing business this morning. Bond inclined himself with a reserved friendliness. It would be a great pleasure. He addressed himself to the girl. I am alone. Would you both care to join me? He pulled out a chair, and while they sat down, he beckoned to a waiter and, despite Mattis's expostulations, insisted on ordering the drinks. Matties and Bond exchanged cheerful talk about the fine weather. The girl was silent. She accepted one of Bond's cigarettes and then smoked it appreciatively, drawing the smoke deeply into her lungs with a little sigh and then exhaling it casually through her lips and nostrils. Her movements were economical and precise with no trace of self-consciousness. Bond felt her presence strongly. While he and Matties talked, he turned from time to time towards her, politely including her in the conversation, but adding up the impressions recorded by each glance. Her hair was very black, and she wore it cut square and low on the nape of the neck, framing her face to below the clear and beautiful line of her jaw. Although it was heavy and moved with the movements of her head, she did not constantly pat it back into place, but let it alone. Her eyes were wide apart and deep blue, and they gazed candidly back at Bond with a touch of ironical disinterest which, to his annoyance, he found he would like to shatter roughly.
Bond was excited by her beauty and intrigued by her composure. The prospect of working with her stimulated him. At the same time, he felt a vague disquiet. On an impulse, he touched wood. Mattis had noticed Bond's preoccupation. After a time, he rose. Oh, forgive me, he said to the girl. I must arrange my rendezvous for dinner tonight. Are you sure you won't mind being left to your own devices this evening? Bond took the cue, and as Mattis crossed the room to the telephone booth beside the bar, he said, well, If you are going to be alone tonight, would you care to have dinner with me? She smiled with the first hint of conspiracy she had shown. I would like to very much, she said. And then perhaps you would chaperone me to the casino, where Monsieur Matisse tells me you are very much at home. Perhaps I will bring you luck. With Matisse gone, her attitude towards him showed a sudden warmth. She seemed to acknowledge that they were a team, and as they discussed the time and place of their meeting, Bon realized that it would be quite easy, after all, to plan the details of his project with her. When Matisse came back to the table, Bon called for his bill. The girl's eyes followed him out onto the boulevard. Matisse moved his chair close to hers and said softly, That is a very good friend of mine. I am glad you have met each other. I can already feel the ice flows on the two rivers breaking up. He smiled. I don't think Bond has ever been melted. It will be a new experience for him. She did not answer him directly. He's very good looking, but there's something cold and ruthless in his... The sentence was never finished. Suddenly, a few feet away, the entire plate glass window shivered into confetti, the blast of a terrific explosion, very near, hit them so that they were rocked back in their chairs. There was an instant of silence. Some objects pattered down onto the pavement outside. Bottles slowly toppled off the shelves behind the bar. Then there were screams and a stampede for the door. Stay there, said Matisse. He kicked back his chair and hurtled through the empty window frame onto the pavement. When Bond left the bar, he walked purposefully along the pavement flanking the tree-lined boulevard towards his hotel a few hundred yards away. There were few people abroad, and the two men standing quietly under a tree on the opposite side of the boulevard looked out of place. Each wore a straw hat, and they had the appearance of a variety turn waiting for a bus on the way to the theatre. Incongruously, each dark, squat little figure was illuminated by a touch of bright colour. A bright red and a bright blue camera case slung from the shoulder. By the time Bond had taken in these details, he had come to within fifty yards of the two men. He was reflecting on the possibilities of cover when an extraordinary and terrible scene was enacted. Red man seemed to give a short nod to blue man, Blue man, and Bond could not see exactly as the trunk of a plane tree obscured his vision, bent forward and seemed to fiddle with his camera case. Then, with a blinding flash of white light, there was the ear-splitting crack of a monstrous explosion, and Bond, despite the protection of the tree trunk, was slammed down to the pavement by a bolt of hot air. He lay, gazing up at the sun, while the air went on twanging with the explosion, as if someone had hit the bass register of a piano with a sledgehammer. When dazed and half-conscious, he raised himself on one knee. A ghastly rain of pieces of flesh and shreds of blood-soaked clothing fell on him. The road was a smoking crater. Of the two men in straw hats, there remained absolutely nothing. Bond felt himself starting to vomit. It was Mattis who got to him first, and by that time Bond was standing with his arm round the tree which had saved his life. He allowed Mattis to lead him off towards the splendide from which guests and servants were pouring in chattering fright. They managed to push through the throng and along the corridor to Bond's room. Mattis paused only to turn on the radio in front of the fireplace, then, while Bond stripped off his blood-flecked clothes, Mattis sprayed him with questions. Merde, but you are lucky he said when Bond had finished. Clearly the bomb was intended for you. They intended to throw it and then dodge behind their tree. But it all came out the other way around. 
Never mind. We will discover the facts. His eyes glittered. Now, get a drink and some lunch and a rest, he ordered Bond. For me, I must get my nose quickly into this affair before the police have muddied the trail with their big black boots. He turned off the radio and waved an affectionate farewell. Bond sat for a while by the window and enjoyed being alive. Bond had always been a gambler. He loved the dry riffle of the cards and the constant unemphatic drama of the quiet figures round the green tables. He was amused by the impartiality of the roulette ball and of the playing cards and their eternal bias. On this June evening, when Bond walked into the Salle Privée, it was with a sensation of confidence and cheerful anticipation that he changed a million francs into plaque of fifty mille and took a seat next to the chef de partie at roulette table number one. Bond borrowed the chef's card and studied the run of the ball since the session had started at three o'clock that afternoon. He always did this, although he knew that each turn of the wheel, each fall of the ball into a numbered slot, has absolutely no connection with its predecessor. He accepted that the game begins afresh each time the croupier picks up the ivory ball and gives one of the four spokes of the wheel a controlled twist clockwise. Bond decided to play one of his favourite gambits and back the first two dozen numbers, each with the maximum, 100,000 francs. After seven coups, he had won six times. His net profit was 400,000 francs. He kept off the table for the eighth throw. Zero turned up. This piece of luck cheered him further, and he decided to back the first and last dozens until he had lost twice. Ten throws later, he rose from the table, one million francs to the good. Directly Bond had started playing in maximums. His game had become the center of interest at the table. An American had shown more than the usual friendliness and pleasure at his winning streak. When Bond rose, he too pushed back his chair and called cheerfully across the table. Thanks for the ride. Guess I owe you a drink. Uh, will you join me? Bond had a feeling that this might be the CIA man. My name's Felix Leiter, said the American. Glad to meet you. Mine's Bond. James Bond. Bond insisted on ordering Leiter's Hague and Hague on the rocks, and then he looked carefully at the barman. A dry martini, he said. One, in a deep champagne goblet. Oui, monsieur. Just a moment. Three measures of Gordon's. One of vodka, half a measure of quina lile. Shake it very well until it's ice cold, then add a large thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? Certainly, monsieur. The barman seemed pleased with the idea. Gosh, that's certainly a drink, said Leiter. Bond laughed. <laughs> when I'm uh, concentrating, he explained, I never have more than one drink before dinner. But I do like that one to be large and very strong and very cold and very well made. This drink's my own invention. I'm going to patent it, when I can think of a good name. Leiter lowered his voice. You better call it the Molotov cocktail after the one you tasted this afternoon. Bond laughed. They sat down. I'm glad to be working with you on this job, Leiter said. Our people are definitely interested. In fact, Washington's pretty sick. We're not running the show. Anyway, I'm under your orders, and I'm to give you any help you ask for. I'm delighted you are, said Bond. I'd be grateful if you'd stick around the casino this evening. I've got an assistant, a Miss Lind, and I'd like to hand her over to you when I start playing. You won't be ashamed of her. She's a good-looking girl. He smiled at Leiter. And you might mark Le Chiffre's two gunmen. I can't imagine he'll try a roughhouse, but you never know. They parted company after arranging to see each other at the casino at around half past ten or eleven, the usual hour for the high tables to begin play. As Bond tied his thin, double-ended black satin tie, he paused for a moment and examined himself levelly in the mirror. His grey-blue eyes looked calmly back with a hint of ironical inquiry. He opened a drawer and took out a light chamois leather holster and slipped it over his left shoulder so that it hung about three inches below his armpit. 
He slipped his single-breasted dinner jacket over his heavy silk evening shirt, verified in the mirror that there was absolutely no sign of the flat gun under his left arm, gave a final pull at his narrow tie, and walked out of the door and locked it. When he turned at the foot of the short stairs towards the bar, he heard the lift door open behind him, and a cool voice call, Good evening. It was the girl. He had remembered her beauty exactly. He was not surprised to be thrilled by it again. Her dress was of black velvet, and there was a thin necklace of diamonds at her throat. Bond's heart lifted. You look absolutely lovely. Business must be good in the radio world. She put her arm through his. Do you mind if we go straight into dinner? She asked. I want to make a grand entrance. And the truth is, there's a horrible secret about black velvet. It marks when you sit down. Of course. Let's go straight in. In her wake, he watched the heads of the diners turn to look at her. As they deciphered the maze of purple ink which covered the menu, Bond beckoned to the sommelier. A small carafe of vodka, very cold, Bond ordered. He said to her abruptly, I can't drink the health of your new frock without knowing your Christian name. Vesper, she said. Bond gave her a look of inquiry. I was born on a very stormy evening, according to my parents, she smiled. Some people like it, others don't. I'm just used to it. I think it's a fine name, said Bond. An idea struck him. Can I borrow it? He explained about the special martini he had invented. The Vesper, he said. It's very appropriate to the violet hour when my cocktail will now be drunk all over the world. We'll have one together when all this is finished. Win or lose. And now, here's luck for tonight, Vesper. Yes, said the girl quietly, as she held up her small glass and looked at him with a curious directness straight in the eyes. Then she leant impulsively towards him, I have some news for you from Mattis. He was longing to tell you himself. It's about the bomb. Bon looked round, but there was no possibility of being overheard. Tell me. His eyes glittered with interest. Apparently the men were part of a pool held in France for this sort of job, saboteurs, thugs and so on. She took a sip of vodka. The agent who briefed them gave them the two camera cases you saw. He told them that the blue case contained a very powerful smoke bomb, the red case was the explosive. They would escape under cover of the smoke. In fact, both cases contained an identical high-explosive bomb. The idea was to destroy you and the bomb-throwers without trace. Go on, said Bond, full of admiration for the ingenuity of the double cross. Well, apparently the men decided to take no chances. It would be better, they thought, to touch off the smoke bomb first, and, of course, they both went up together. A third man was waiting behind the Splendide to pick his two friends up. When he saw what had happened, he assumed they had bungled. But the police picked up some fragments of the unexploded red bomb, and he was confronted with them. When he saw that they had been tricked, he started to talk. But there's nothing to link all this with Le Chiffre. Le Chiffre's name means absolutely nothing to the one who survived. She finished her story just as the waiters arrived with caviar and a mound of hot toast. Incidentally, Bond asked, how did you come to get mixed up in this affair? What section are you in? I'm personal assistant to Head of S, said Vesper. As it was his plan, he wanted his section to have a hand in the operation, and he asked M if I could go. I had to meet Mattis in Paris and come down with him. I've got a friend who is a vendeuse with Dior, and somehow she managed to borrow me this frock. Otherwise I couldn't possibly have competed with all these people. She made a gesture towards the room. The office was very jealous that I was to work with a double O. Of course, you're our heroes. I was enchanted. Bond frowned. It's not difficult to get a double O number if you're prepared to kill people, he said. How do you like your caviar? I'm loving my dinner. It seems a shame. She stopped, warned by a cold look in Bond's eye. If it wasn't for the job... We wouldn't be here, he said. Suddenly he regretted the intimacy of their dinner and of their talk. 
Let's consider what has to be done, he said in a matter-of-fact voice. She listened to him coldly but with obedience. Don't imagine that this is going to be any fun, her chief had said. He thinks of nothing but the job on hand, and while it's on, he's absolute hell to work for. Don't fall for him. I don't think he's got much heart. Now, at a hint that they were finding pleasure together, Bond had suddenly turned to ice and had brutally veered away as if warmth were poison to him. She felt hurt and foolish. Then she gave a mental shrug and concentrated with all her attention on what he was saying. She would not make the same mistake again. Bond explained to Vespa just how Baccarat is played. What happens is this. The banker announces an opening bank of 500,000 francs. The player next to the banker, or number one, can accept this bet and push his money out onto the table or pass it. Then number two has the right to take it, and if he refuses, then number three, and so on around the table. If no single player takes it all, the bet is offered to the table as a whole, and everyone chips in, including sometimes the spectators around the table, until the 500,000 is made up. When it gets to a million or two, it's often difficult to find a taker. At that moment, I shall always try and step in and accept the bet. In fact, I shall attack Le Chief's bank whenever I get a chance, until either I bust his bank or he's bust me. It may take some time, but in the end, one of us is bound to break the other, irrespective of the other players at the table. Bond drank some champagne and continued... The object of the game is to hold two or three cards which together count nine points, or as nearly nine as possible. Court cards and tens count nothing, aces one each, any other card its face value. When the banker deals me my two cards, if they add up to eight or nine, they're a natural. In the end, Bond stubbed out his cigarette and called for the bill. It's the natural eights and nines that matter, and I must just see that I get more of them than he does. While telling the story of the game and anticipating the coming fight, Bond's face had lit up again. The prospect of at least getting to grips with Le Chiffre stimulated him and quickened his pulse. He seemed to have completely forgotten the brief coolness between them, and Vesper was relieved and entered into his mood. He paid the bill and gave a handsome tip to the sommelier. Vesper rose and led the way out of the restaurant and out onto the steps of the hotel. The big Bentley was waiting, and Bond drove Vesper over, parking as close to the entrance as he could. As they walked through the ornate anterooms, he hardly spoke. She saw his nostrils were slightly flared. In other respects, he seemed completely at ease, acknowledging cheerfully the greetings of the casino functionaries. Before they had penetrated very far into the main room, Felix Leiter detached himself from one of the roulette tables and greeted Bond as an old friend. After being introduced to Vesper Lind and exchanging a few remarks, Leiter said, Well, since you're playing Baccarat this evening, will you allow me to show Miss Lind how to break the bank at roulette? Then perhaps we could come and watch you when your game starts to warm up. Bond excused himself. You will be in excellent hands with my friend Felix Leiter. He gave a short smile which embraced them both. Then he strolled slowly across the room between the thronged tables until he came to the top of the room where the broad baccarat table waited behind the brass rail. The chef de partie lifted the velvet-covered chain. I've kept number six as you wished, Monsieur Bond. Bond sat down with a nod to the players on his right and left. Opposite him, the banker's chair was vacant. He glanced round the table he knew most of the players by sight, but few of their names. At number nine, there was Lord Danvers, a distinguished but weak-looking man whose franks were presumably provided by his rich American wife, a middle-aged woman with the predatory mouth of a barracuda who sat at number three. At number one, to the right of the bank, was a well-known Greek gambler who owned a profitable shipping line. Number two was Carmel Delane, the American film star with alimony from three husbands to burn. Numbers four and five were a Mr. and Mrs. Dupont. They both had a business-like look about them. Bond had just finished his sketchy summing up of the players when Le Chiffre 
with the silence and economy of movement of a big fish, came through the opening in the brass rail and took his place directly opposite Bond in the banker's chair. As the croupier fitted six packs of cards with one swift exact motion into the metal and wooden shoe, Le Chiffre said something quietly to him. Messieurs, mesdames, les jeux sont faits. Un banco de cinq cent mille. Le Chiffre crouched over the shoe. He gave it a short, deliberate slap to settle the cards. Then, with a thick white forefinger, he pressed gently on the pink tongue and slipped out the first card six inches or a foot towards the Greek at number one. Then he slipped out a card for himself, then another for the Greek, then one more for himself. He sat immobile, not touching his own cards. He looked at the Greek's face. With his flat wooden spatula, like a long bricklayer's trowel, the croupier delicately lifted up the Greek's two cards. He dropped them with a quick movement so that they lay just before the Greek's pale hairy hands, which lay inert like two watchful pink crabs on the table. The two pink crabs scuttled out together, and the Greek gathered the cards into his wide left hand and cautiously bent his head so that he could see, in the shadow made by his cupped hand, the value of the bottom of the two cards. His face was quite impassive. Then he lifted his head and looked Le Chiffre in the eye. No, said the Greek flatly. Le Chiffre picked up his two cards and turned them face upwards on the table with a faint snap. They were a four and a five, an undefeatable natural nine. He had won. Neuf à la banque. Quietly, said the croupier. With his spatula, he faced the Greek's two cards. Elisette, he said unemotionally, lifting up gently the corpses of the seven and queen and slipping them through the wide slot in the table near his chair to which all dead cards are consigned. The Greek pushed forward five plaques of one hundred thousand and the croupier added these to Le Chiffre's half-million plaque which lay in the centre of the table. The croupier announced quietly, Un banco de million. Suivi, murmured the Greek, meaning that he exercised his right to follow up his lost bet. Bond lit a cigarette and settled himself in his chair. The Greek, after taking a third card, could achieve no better than a four to the bank's seven. Un banco de deux millions, said the croupier. The players on Bond's left remained silent. Banco, said Bond. Le Chiffre looked incuriously at him, the whites of his eyes, which showed all round the irises, lending something impassive and doll-like to his gaze. The other players sensed a tension between the two gamblers, and there was silence as Le Chiffre fingered the four cards out of the shoe. The croupier slipped Bond's two cards across to him. Bond, still with his eyes holding Le Chiffre's, reached his right hand out a few inches, glanced down very swiftly, then, as he looked up again impassively at Le Chiffre, with a disdainful gesture, he tossed the cards face upwards on the table. They were a four and a five, an unbeatable nine. There was a little gasp of envy from the table, and the players to the left of Bond exchanged rueful glances at their failure to accept the two million franc bet. With a hint of a shrug, Le Chiffre slowly faced his own two cards and flicked them away with his fingernail. They were two valueless knaves. Le baccarat, intoned the croupier, as he spaded the thick chips over the table to Bond. Bond slipped them into his right-hand pocket. His face showed no emotion, but he was pleased with the success of his first coup and with the outcome of the silent clash of wills across the table. As the game went on, Bond looked over the spectators leaning on the high brass rail round the table. He soon saw Le Chiffre's two gunmen. They stood behind and to either side of the banker. The one more or less behind Le Chiffre's right arm was tall and funereal in his dinner jacket. Bond guessed that he would kill without interest or concern, and that he would prefer strangling. The other man was short and very dark, with a flat head covered with thickly greased hair. A chunky malacca cane with a rubber tip hung on the rail beside him. His mouth hung vacantly half-open and revealed very bad teeth. 
He wore a heavy black moustache, and the backs of his hands on the rail were matted with black hair. Naked, Bond supposed, he would be an obscene object. The game continued uneventfully, but with a slight bias against the bank. Le Chiffre showed no trace of emotion. He continued to play like an automaton, never speaking except when he gave instructions in a lower side to the croupier at the opening of each new bank. It was at ten minutes past one by Bond's watch, when the whole pattern of play suddenly altered. The Greek at number one was still having a bad time. He had lost the first coup of half a million francs and the second. He passed the third time, leaving a bank of two million. Carmel Delane at number two refused it. So did Lady Danvers at number three. The Dupont looked at each other. Banco, said Mrs. Dupont, and promptly lost to the banker's natural eight. Un banco de quatre millions said the croupier. Banco, said Bond, pushing out a wad of notes. Again he fixed Le Chiffre with his eye. Again he gave only a cursory look at his two cards. No, he said. He held a marginal five. The position was dangerous. Le Chiffre turned up a knave and a four. He gave the shoe another slap. He drew a three. Set à la banque, said the croupier. Et cinq, he added as he tipped Bond's losing cards face upwards. Un banco de huit million. Suivi, said Bond, and lost again to a natural nine. In two coups, he had lost twelve million francs. By scraping the barrel, he had just sixteen million francs left, exactly the amount of the next banco. Suddenly, Bond felt the sweat on his palms. Like snow in sunshine, his capital had melted. With the covetous deliberation of the winning gambler, Le Chiffre was tapping a light tattoo on the table with his right hand. Bond looked across into the eyes of murky basalt. Do you want the full treatment? They seemed to ask. Suivi, Bond said softly. His mouth felt suddenly dry. He looked up and saw Vesper and Felix Leiter standing where the gunman with the stick had stood. He did not know how long they had been standing there. Leiter looked faintly worried, but Vesper smiled encouragement at him. He heard a faint rattle on the rail behind him and turned his head. The battery of bad teeth under the black moustache gaped vacantly back at him. Le jeu est fait, said the croupier, and the two cards came slithering towards him over the green bays. He glanced at the cards. Then he looked again. It was nearly as bad as it could have been. The king of hearts and an ace. The ace of spades. A card. He still kept all emotion out of his voice. Le Chiffre faced his own two cards. He had a queen and a black five. He looked at Bond and pressed out another card with a wide forefinger. The table was absolutely silent. The croupier slipped it over to Bond. It was a good card, the five of hearts. He now had a count of six and Le Chiffre a count of five. The odds were on Bond's side, but now it was Le Chiffre who looked across into Bond's eyes and hardly glanced at the card as he flicked it face upwards on the table. It was, unnecessarily, the best, a four, giving the bank a count of nine. He had won. Bond was beaten and cleaned out. Bond sat silent, frozen with defeat. He opened his wide black case and took out a cigarette. He took a deep lungful of smoke and expelled it between his teeth with a faint hiss. What now? Back to the hotel and bed, avoiding the commiserating eyes of Matisse and Leiter and Vesper. Back to the telephone call to London, and then tomorrow the plane home, the taxi up to Regent's Park, the walk up the stairs and along the corridor, and M's cold face across the table, his forced sympathy, his better luck next time. And, of course, there couldn't be one. Not another chance like this. He looked round the table and up at the spectators. Few were looking at him. They were waiting, 
waiting to see if anyone would conceivably challenge this huge bank of 32 million francs, this wonderful run of banker's luck. Leiter had vanished, not wishing to look Bond in the eye after the knockout, he supposed. Yet Vesper looked curiously unmoved, but then Bond reflected she knew nothing of the game, had no notion, probably, of the bitterness of his defeat. The huissier was coming towards Bond inside the rail. He placed a squat envelope beside Bond on the table. It was as thick as a dictionary. Bond's heart thumped. He took the heavy, anonymous envelope below the level of the table and slit it open with his thumbnail, noticing that the gum was still wet on the flap. Unbelieving, and yet knowing it was true, he felt the broad wads of notes. He slipped them into his pockets, retaining the half-sheet of notepaper which was pinned to the topmost of them. Marshal aid, 32 million francs, with the compliments of the USA. Bond swallowed. He looked over towards Vesper. Felix Leiter was again standing beside her. He grinned slightly, and Bond smiled back and raised his hand from the table in a small gesture of benediction. Then he set his mind to sweeping away all traces of the sense of complete defeat which had swamped him a few minutes before. This was a reprieve, but only a reprieve. There could be no more miracles. This time, he had to win. The croupier had completed his task of making a pile of the giant stake in the middle of the table. There lay thirty-two thousand pounds. Perhaps, thought Bond, Le Chiffre needed just one more coup, a few million francs, to achieve his object. Then he would have made his fifty million francs and would leave the table. He showed no signs of moving, and Bond guessed with relief that somehow he must have overestimated Le Chiffre's resources. At last, Le Chiffre nodded. Un banco de trente-deux millions, the croupier's voice rang out. A silence built itself up round the table. It was then that Bond leant slightly forward. Suivi, he said quietly. There was an excited buzz round the table. The word ran through the casino. People crowded in. Thirty-two million. For most of them, it was more than they had earned all their lives. It was, literally, a small fortune. One of the casino directors consulted with the chef de partie. The chef de partie turned apologetically to Bond. Excusez-moi, monsieur. La mise? It was an indication that Bond really must show he had the money to cover the bet. They knew, of course, that he was a very wealthy man, but after all, thirty-two millions. It was when Bond shoveled the great wad of notes out onto the table that he caught a swift exchange of glances between Le Chiffre and the gunman standing directly behind Bond. Immediately, he felt something hard press into the base of his spine. At the same time, a thick voice speaking southern French said softly, urgently, just behind his right ear, This is a gun, monsieur. It is absolutely silent. It can blow the base of your spine off without a sound. You will appear to have fainted. I shall be gone. Withdraw your bet before I count ten. If you call for help, I shall fire. The voice was confident. Bond believed it. The thick walking stick was explained. Bond knew the type of gun he had tested them himself. Ah, said the voice. Bond turned his head. There was the man leaning forward close behind him, smiling broadly under his black moustache, as if he was wishing Bond luck, completely secure in the noise and the crowd. The discoloured teeth came together. D, said the grinning mouth. Bond looked across. Le Chiffre was watching him. His eyes glittered back at Bond. His mouth was open and he was breathing fast. Trois. Bond looked over at Vesper and Felix Leiter, they were smiling and talking to each other. The fools. Where was Matisse? Where were those famous men of his? Quatre. Couldn't someone see what was happening? Cinq. The croupier was tidying up the pile of notes. The chef de partie bowed smilingly towards Bond. Directly the stake was in order, he would announce, Le jeu est fait. And the gun would fire, whether the gunman had reached ten or not. 
Six. Bond decided. It was a chance. He carefully moved his hands to the edge of the table, gripped it, edged his buttocks right back, feeling the sharp gun sight grind into his coccyx. Sept. The chef de partie turned to Le Chiffre with his eyebrows lifted, waiting for the banker's nod that he was ready to play. Suddenly, Bond heaved backwards with all his strength. His momentum tipped the crossbar of the chair back down so quickly that it cracked across the malacca tube and wrenched it from the gunman's hand before he could pull the trigger. Bond went head over heels onto the ground amongst the spectator's feet, his legs in the air. There were cries of dismay. Hands helped him to his feet and brushed him down. Bond held on to the brass rail. He looked confused and embarrassed. He brushed his hands across his forehead. A momentary faintness, he said. It is nothing... The excitement, the heat. There were expressions of sympathy. Would Monsieur prefer to withdraw, to lie down, to go home? Should a doctor be fetched? Bond shook his head. He was perfectly all right now. His excuses to the table. To the banker, also. A new chair was brought, and he sat down. He looked across at Le Chiffre. Through his relief at being alive, he felt a moment of triumph at what he saw. Some fear in the fat, pale face. There was no trace of the gunman, but the huissier was looking for someone to claim the Malacca stick. Bond beckoned to him. If you will give it to that gentleman over there. He indicated Felix Leiter. He will return it. It belongs to an acquaintance of his. Bond grimly reflected that a short examination would reveal to Leiter why he had made such an embarrassing public display of himself. He turned back to the table and tapped the green cloth in front of him to show that he was ready. La partie continue, announced the chef impressively. Un banco de trente-deux millions. The spectators craned forward. Bond's mind was clear again. By a miracle, he had survived a devastating wound. The success of his gambit with the chair had wiped out all memories of the dreadful valley of defeat through which he had just passed. The cards were waiting for him. They must not fail him. The two cards slithered towards him across the green sea. Like an octopus under a rock, Le Chiffre watched him from the other side of the table. Would it be the lift of the heart which a nine brings or an eight brings? He fanned the two cards under the curtain of his hand. The muscles of his jaw rippled as he clenched his teeth. His whole body stiffened in a reflex of self-defense. He had two queens, two red queens. They looked roguishly back at him from the shadows. They were the worst. They were nothing. Zero. Baccarat. A card, said Bond, fighting to keep hopelessness out of his voice. He felt Le Chiffre's eyes boring into his brain. The banker slowly turned his own two cards face up. He had a count of three, a king and a black three. Bond softly exhaled a cloud of tobacco smoke. He still had a chance. Now he was really faced with a moment of truth. Le Chiffre slapped the shoe, slipped out a card, Bond's fate, and slowly turned it face up. It was a nine. A wonderful nine of hearts. The card known in gypsy magic was a whisper of love, a whisper of hate. The card that meant almost certain victory for Bond. Bond's cards lay on the table before him, the two impersonal pale pink patterned backs and the faced nine of hearts. The sweat was running down either side of the banker's beaky nose, his thick tongue came out slyly and licked a drop out of the corner of his red gash of a mouth. He looked at Bond's cards and then at his own and then back at Bond's. Then his whole body shrugged and he slipped out a card for himself from the lisping shoe. He faced it. The table craned. It was a wonderful card. A five. Huit à la banque, said the croupier. As Bond sat silent, Le Chiffre suddenly grinned wolfishly. He must have won. The croupier spatula reached almost apologetically across the table. 
There was not a man at the table who did not believe Bond was defeated. The spatula flicked the two pink cards over on their backs. The gay red queens smiled up at the lights. Eleanor! A great gasp went up round the table, and then a hubbub of talk. Bond's eyes were on Le Chiffre. The big man fell back in his chair as if slugged above the heart. His mouth opened and shut once or twice in protest, and his right hand felt at his throat. As the huge stack of plaque was shunted across the table to Bond, the banker reached into an inner pocket of his jacket and threw a wad of notes onto the table. The croupier riffled through them. Un banco de dix millions, he announced. This is the kill, thought Bond. This man has reached the point of no return. He has come to where I stood an hour ago, and he is making the last gesture that I made. But if this man loses, there is no one to come to his aid, no miracle to help him. Bond sat back and lit a cigarette. On a small table beside him, half a bottle of Clico and a glass had materialised. Without asking who the benefactor was, Bond filled the glass to the brim and drank it down in two long draughts. Banco, he said, speaking straight at Le Chiffre. Once more the two cards were borne over to him, and this time the croupier slipped them into the green lagoon between his outstretched arms. Bond curled his right hand in, glanced briefly down, and flipped the cards face up into the middle of the table. Le Neuf, said the croupier. Le Chiffre was gazing down at his own two black kings. Et le Baccarat. And the croupier eased across the table the fat tide of plaque. Le Chiffre watched them go to join the serried millions in the shadow of Bond's left arm. Then he stood up slowly, and without a word he brushed past the players to the break in the rail. He unhooked the velvet-covered chain and let it fall. The spectators opened a way for him. They looked at him curiously and rather fearfully, as if he carried the smell of death on him. Then he vanished from Bond's sight. And Alex Jennings reads the second and final part of Casino Royale at the same time next week. It was abridged by Sally Marmion and the producer was Di Spears. Well, after our foray into the murky world of Casino Royale, who better to share his inheritance tracks with us next than an actor who played 007 in no less than seven Bond films with, it has to be said, a distinct twinkle in the eye. He is... Sir Roger Moore.